that, let's bring in Karan Bhatia. You know him as the Ask the Experts podcast host, best hair in the boxing game, also producer of uh, PBC content as well. You might be seeing us on your screens promoting Errol Spence and Danny Garcia. My man, Karan, how you doing today? Man, I'm doing well. Yeah, hopefully uh, me and you come into a small screen sometime <laughs> soon, hopefully featured on uh, countdown shows. Looking forward to some big fights. And we, of course, have to talk about this massive event. I can't wait. Yeah, of course. So, uh, like I said, a lot to do. A lot. You know, it's a big fight when we're now almost a week removed from it, and we're still discussing it. All the ramifications of it. When you have a, a, a fighter like T. Fimo who rose to the top like he did, there's a lot to discuss. And I want to talk about first with you is what his stance now is in the world of boxing. And you take a look at it. There's a lot of clutter in the boxing world. It's such a fractured sport. You only fight two to three times a year. Really hard to break through when you're in the world of boxing. But now you have a guy like Tiafimo who's very clear. We're watching his career take off. We're watching his career go on from his knockouts that he had on these undercards on ESPN to banging the drum for Lomachenko as a 20-year-old to knocking out Comey and getting his title right into Lomachenko and winning it. So he's writing something special right now and we're all just sitting back and watching it. I mean, he's broken through. That's really hard to do. And not only that, is he's broken through and now he is the face of this young generation. We're in a great time where there's a lot of stars that are under the age of 25, but it's without a doubt that Teofimo Lopez right now is the leader of that revolution. No, 100%. It's it's watching this young man evolve and climb the pound-for-pound pound ranks. And I think the, the biggest thing is we spend a lot of time, Dan, with young fighters. And when we talk to them, they always have these plans and these ambitions. And they say, I'm going to beat X guy by this fight, and I'm going to be champion by here. Teofimo actually <laughs> did all that. The blueprint was set out by his dad, and he actually followed that. He became a title holder. He beat the pound-for-pound pound number one guy. So if you look at – if the question is where does he stand in boxing, I mean, it's right, right up there at the top. I mean, who would be higher than him? You could say Canelo Alvarez, obviously, is probably the consensus pound-for-pound pound number one. Terrence Crawford's still out there. Spence is a question mark. We don't really know exactly what, what this Spence is. Inui, Usyk, Fury, Pacquiao maybe. You know, Pacquiao's on the other side of 40. Teofimo's 23 years old. And he just knocked off consensus number one. So obviously it goes without saying that now he has skyrocketed uh, to the top of the pound for pound rankings. And it, it's for us, it's a treat that we, now we have maybe 15, 10, 15, maybe more years to see this guy compete. No, it's interesting. And 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 you, a lot of people have brought this up is now who's the face of boxing. And of course, it's still Canelo Alvarez as far as I'm concerned. You know, Tyson Fury in the mix there as well, uh, you know, being a heavyweight and being so brash. But both those guys, uh, one of them is overseas in in, in uh, Tyson Fury. He fights in the mostly, you know, I know he's come over and fought in, in the States, but is based in the, in the UK. And he's also on the tail end of his career. Canelo Alvarez in the prime of his career, doesn't speak English. I know he may does in his off time, but doesn't speak English, doesn't do a lot of interviews. You have a guy who's 23 years old, very media friendly, which is, I think, a very smart thing on, on his part. He takes time to, to speak with the media. He takes time to ask how you're doing. That stuff, that stuff matters there. But it's interesting to see where he ranks, not only in boxing, but in, in the world uh, with top rank. You know, I, I had this conversation with Brian Campbell uh, after Spence versus, um, I think it was Spence versus Porter, where I went on one of his shows, and we talked about uh, this, the brand of PBC. Who's most important to the PBC brand? And you throw out names like Wilder, you throw out names like Spence, uh, David Benavidez for being young and a Mexican-American fighter. But who are the names at top rank? I mean, you got to think, you know, Tyson Fury is at the top. But I think Tiafimo now has supplanted Terrence Crawford in terms of what he means for that company. Well, he's certainly supplanted, of course, Vasily Lomachenko, right? We know that. He was obviously at the top in terms of top-ranked fighters and top of the game. Terrence Crawford, same thing. Now, I think it's, it, it also plays to a point that you brought up earlier, and that is – Boxing, obviously, is about what you can do in the ring, but there's also your persona outside of the ring, right? We saw that with Floyd Mayweather. He became the villain. People tuned in because they wanted to see him lose. So that actually is an important element about it. If you look at Vasily Lomachenko, as skilled as he was in the boxing ring, it seemed like fans couldn't necessarily connect with this guy. Maybe he was a little guarded. He had a good personality, but it wasn't in your face. It wasn't interviews the way that Teofimo is. We've interviewed Teofimo a ton of times. He keeps it real. He'll give us access. He'll talk to you, not just us, to anyone. He mm -hmm. likes to, to be that face. He likes to have fun. He likes to talk. And that's a huge part of building that persona and getting fans engaged. And the fact that he has that and he has the boxing ability. And let me just add, I tweeted this uh, when watching the fight. We know how brash Teofimo is outside of the ring. He talks smack. He, you know, we've seen the celebrations, the backflips, all the Heisman, everything. 
But if you watch that fight, he had a laser-like focus in the ring. No messing around in that ring. His eyes were locked in on Lomachenko. So that makes it all that more impressive. All I want to say to Teofimo is don't go Hollywood on us now, now that you did this. <laughs> I know he has a lot of text messages. He woke up to almost 500 text messages. Uh, but yeah, don't go Hollywood. I, I don't think he will. And, and How many of those texts were you from you, Dan? Uh, at least three or four. 30? At least yeah. three or four. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing with him, and I, I recommend people go back and read the story on ESPN that Mark Kriegel wrote last year about some of the things that Tiafimo has gone through in his life leading up at the point when he wrote that only 22 years old you know things with, with fighting with fighting his own demons you know mental health having panic attacks dealing with everything that goes on with his family because he had a very tumultuous uh, family life I think that was very well documented and that maybe you could understand how he was able to fight the way he fought in that ring because people said wow I thought he was going to go in there and brawl but he was very poised in there he was very collected he actually outwitted uh, Vasyl Lomachenko, but if you take a look at some of his uh, of his of his life and what he's been through, you can understand how he's so poised in there and how he's you know 23 going on like 45 at this point. <laughs> well, also we have to add, I, I believe Teofimo struggles with asthma, and now we look at the global pandemic, right? In terms of how that can affect someone like that. So now you add even more adversity, especially during this big time in a lead up to this massive event. And to, to your question about top ring fighters, I mean, we talked about Fury, Inoue, um, we know about Loma, we know Jose Ramirez, Peter Biev. I mean, they have a, they have a ton uh, of champions, but is it, it? It's hard to say that someone's going to be at the top of the heap that is more than a unified champion who just beat the top pound for pound fighter uh who is a good talker and who's only 23 years old i mean that sounds like a home run can't miss uh right there no it's great for boxing it, it's really good for boxing and it's a jolt because let's be honest i mean these last couple of months have been rough i mean you come in and do this show week after week the pandemic really hit all facets of of life really hit boxing hard and this past week the lead up to this fight everyone was in unison you know the boxing twitter came together for a week there was no denying that there was you can buy the hype for this fight and to pl- See how it played out. It wasn't the greatest fight early on, but it turned out to be exciting towards the end. The right guy won. Tiafimo Lopez is now the face of the lightweight division. He could potentially uh, be the face of boxing. I mean, other side of things, we're going to talk about what's next for each guy because maybe we see a rematch. All right, Karen, you're only as good as your last performance. Everyone wants to know what's next. What's next? What are you going to do? Who are you going to fight next? What... You know, but you can jump up to a different weight. Tiafimo Lopez, Vasil Lomachenko. Let's start with Tiafimo. Now, oh man, the guy has told us numerous times that he is not long for the weight at 135. He had issues getting down to the weight early in his, in his career. He teamed up with perfecting athletes. And I think he looked in phenomenal shape for his last fight. But let's be honest, 23 years old, growing body. I believe he stays at 135 for... One's offense, you know, you can throw out names, you know, uh, you know, there's not a lot of names at 135 actually, but the one fight that I got a lot of blowback for, and I put it on Twitter and a lot of people said, nah, I don't want to see that, I don't want to see that, is the rematch. I mean, you have Bob Arum just yesterday, if you check out Boxing Scene, say that I'm going to sit down with both guys, I'm going to show them the monetary figures of what a rematch could be. I think they're going to jump at it because let's be real, the most realistic big money fight for each guy is a rematch. That's just my opinion. I 100% want to see a rematch, and I'll tell you why. Obviously, we know Lomachenko turned it on late. He realized what was going on, that he was losing these rounds, and he had to had to try a different strategy, and that meant getting hit. That might be, we'll talk about this later, he had the shoulder issues coming in. Maybe he realized, I just have to fight through that because otherwise I'm going to lose this fight. But with that said, how interesting would it have been if Lomachenko had that strategy, that plan B, a few rounds earlier. I'm talking like one or two rounds earlier. I think that would make it tremendously interesting. And also, I saw uh, some fans' analysis who who made a really good point. Lomachenko usually pivots around the ring, and most fighters can't really make movements back with him, right? Mm -hmm. So he ends up in a position that they're not used to, and he lands punches. Lopez figured that out pretty quickly, and he was the aggressor, and he was moving. So now, Lomachenko, with that knowledge, we know he likes to download knowledge and study his opponent. Clearly, he was doing that in round one. I don't think he threw a punch. Um, Um, Through four. So (laughs) there you go. And and I'm talking to the right people to tell me that. So four punches in round one. 
And I think now that he has 12 rounds of knowledge, I think it would be tremendously interesting, and I would love to see that. What's next for Lopez? If it isn't the rematch, I mean, we've heard Ryan Garcia's name thrown out. Um, what about, like, Jorge Linares? He knocked yes. down Loma. Maybe that would be an interesting matchup. Yep. But to your point, Lopez just won all four belts. I don't think he wants to just give this up and move on to a new division with no no championship belts. I don't know if the franchise belt is his or will tra- it will travel. That's a whole other discussion. But I'm pretty sure he's going to want to now defend the, being the unified champion, right? Yeah, I, I think so, too. And... It- it's interesting because there's there's you brought up Verdejo and I'm, I wrote this down here some of the names at 135 that he could potentially fight not named uh, Vasil Lomachenko so this is the Linares Felix Verdejo uh, there's the winner of the George Cambosos Lee Selby fight you we don't know about uh, defenses too does he have to, he has four belts now and as we know it, when you become a four belt champion one of them's belts is leaving because you're not going to be able to make all the defenses there so I, I, a fight with Lomachenko I, I don't necessarily want to see it. But if you take a look at how the business of boxing works, it makes the most sense. If they're able to put fans, have a live gate, let's say they do it in April, they could do it at MSG, uh, they could do it outside in Vegas, you get a huge live gate. I mean, who knows if it's on pay-per-view or not. That's uh, That would be something that would be, have to be hashed out uh, between them. But there's a lot of money to be made for that. And I think, you know, you know, T. Fimo had said it himself. He goes, you know, F it. I'm not giving him a rematch. But, you know, you say a lot of things when you're in the heat of the moment. You take a look at the options that are out there at 135, Really not that many. <laughs> it really isn't that many. If you want to jump to 140, Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor, they're going to have to figure it out at 140. That fight's not going to happen until at least February or March. So that means they have they won't be ready for that Tiafimo fight until the end of the year. So what's he, what's he going to do? He's not going to just sit and wait to see what happens at 140. He's going to fight at 135 again. So either against one of those names that I just mentioned, a Felix Verdejo, a Linares, a Lee Selby, or a Combosos, or... He can take big time money and get paid the right way. He could be the A side now. He talks so much about how he felt slighted during the negotiations, and you know he said it in his press conference that listen, I'm I'm the guy now. I know Top Rank. He made some weird or cryptic comments towards Top Rank about how he didn't like how there wasn't a rematch clause, or if they're pretty much if I lose, this is the type of money you're going to be making now in your career. So he can make a lot more. He's in the driver's seat. There's no doubt about that. So a rematch, with, a rematch with Lomachenko, I think. You know, makes a lot of sense. A rematch makes sense for us as fans. It makes sense for the fighters. And like you said, financially, it makes a ton of sense. There was the great feature on ESPN before the main event. And it was Bob Arum talking to uh, talking to Lopez after he knocked out Comey. And yep. he wanted to invite Lomachenko into the ring. And Lopez was a little hesitant because it was his moment. Arum's like, don't F this up, kid. <laughs> and so it doesn't surprise me that he's saying... Hey, there's also now a rematch possible. Don't F this up, kid. We can all financially benefit from this, and hopefully the fans can benefit from it too. The other name, of course, after the fight, Lopez called out two-time email champion Devin Haney. Uh, And that's, of course, you know, this whole mess with the franchise belt and and confusing things. That would be another great matchup. I'd love to see that too. He has has options. He may want to take an easier touch now that he just went through this and then maybe do the rematch. Or, to your point... Let's do it in spring. Let's do it outdoors. Let's get some fans. Let's make it a big event. But I think all signs point to a rematch, and that's what I'd love to see personally. Right, and I'm glad you brought up Devin Haney because I was listing names of realistic fights. Obviously, that's the fight everyone wants to see is him fight Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney, or Javante Davis. Just don't think it's going to happen just yet. That I don't, I'm not a big fan of marinating, but that's a fight that you can let marinate for a, a year. Because they're not, you know, they're going to win and they're, they're they're very young. You can make that happen. These are the other names. All right, Karan, on the other side of things, we're going to talk about Vasil Lomachenko. What is next for him? Is he going to stay at lightweight? Is he going to go back down? And the judges, of course. We always have to talk about scorecards when there's a really, really good fight and a big fight. On the other side of things, we're going to touch on all that. Karan Bhatia, I want to talk to you about... Vasily Lomachenko. What is next for him? A lot of different routes he can go. 32 years old. I think a lot of people have him at around 50 years old because he's been in the game for, for so long. Shoulder surgery, that came out on Monday. That was a little bit of a shocker because now you can say, wait a second, there's a reason why he didn't he came on so late, didn't throw any punches. Uh, he had this, the surgery and that came out. That doesn't exactly make him look uh, uh, really good. But if you're not, I'm thinking about this. You really have to give him the benefit of the doubt here. He's never really made excuses in his career. If he had a shoulder injury, he had a shoulder injury. And he's getting it done now so he could potentially fight again uh, in 2020 or 2021. That, that's a good sign. What's exactly next for him? Is he going to stay at lightweight or is he going to go back down to 126 or 130 where he was much more dominant? 
What's next for him? It's going to be healing that shoulder, right? And stop me if you've heard this one. A top pound-for-pound -pound fighter <laughs> loses a huge matchup and complains about a shoulder industry. Wait, did, he, did he go in the this ocean to fix it? Sorry? And did he go into the ocean to fix the shoulder like Manny did? <laughs> like Manny did. Yeah, this is deja vu all over again, man. And so I think that um, if you look at Loma, I mean, obviously that's going to be the, the the next thing for him. Agus and Papachenko, they said we lost one week of sparring because, the, um, because of the injury. They said that Loma actually threatened to retire if they didn't let him fight this fight. So Loma really wanted to fight this fight with the injury. So you can't really say it's an excuse. If you choose to say, I'm going to suck it up and do this, then you have to deal with the consequences. So I actually don't think Loma's necessarily using it as an excuse. I don't remember him necessarily saying that in the post-fight interview. He did have the poor sportsmanship of walking out of the ring, not staying in the ring for Lopez's moment. But when you listen to his post-fight interview, he said, well, I thought I won the fight. I mean, <laughs> find me a fighter who doesn't think they won the fight. They right. all think they won the fight, right? right. Yeah. So that's totally fine. Um, what's next for him, though? I think he needs some rest, relaxation, heal the shoulder. And then I do think if he doesn't do a rematch, he should take a softer touch get the confidence back, and then do the rematch. There are some names, though. I agree. I, the rematch, obviously, we just talked about how I think he should take the rematch. But if he goes down to 130, there are some really intriguing matchups right in top rank. He can fight Shakur Stevenson. He can fight the winner of Oscar Valdez and Burchell. Uh, you can go over, if not on the other side of the street, Jojo Diaz is there, and also Javante Davis. I still think Lomachenko, even coming off of a loss to to uh to Fimo, could still fight uh, Tank Davis if he beats uh, uh, Santa Cruz. There's a lot left in the tank for Lomachenko, and I don't really appreciate a lot of the people slandering his name because this guy was the consensus top three for a while. Uh, he is an outstanding boxer. One loss doesn't mean that your career is over. But moving on, let's talk about the scorecards. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that we always have to seem seems like we're discussing, whether it's poor refing, uh, whether it's the sanctioning bodies, whether it's, it's the judges. In this case, Julie Letterman put out a card of 119-109 for Tiafimo, 11 rounds to one. Uh, and it was an outstanding fight. It was a great buildup. Everyone was on the same page. All boxing fans were invested in this fight. But afterwards, I'm looking on Twitter, and uh, you might not know who this guy is, but Phil Hughes, former Yankee pitcher, of all people, never, very rarely ever tweets about boxing. And I see him tweeting that 11 to 1 for, for Lopez. You got to be kidding me. I was like, oh my God, finally, there's a big boxing match on that 3 million people tuned in to watch. And we're still talking about the judges. 119 to 109. And I have some, I'm tired of people talking about, we got to do something. We gotta do, what, are the, what are the solutions? What are we going to do to get better judging? And just one thing that I thought of is in Major League Baseball, the umpires have to address the media at the end of every series. They only talk to one media member. And they're all, it's off camera, but they get quotes. And they're able to talk about, why did you have that call? You know, what was your thought process here on that play at second base? And I understand umpires uh, would be equivalent to a referee. It's different than a judge. But how come these judges don't have to address the media for their scorecards? How come they can just dart off after the fight and not have to say anything about it. If Phil Hughes is weighing in on a scorecard, you know it was a terrible scorecard, and that's all that needs to be said about that. If you look at the scorecard, obviously everyone is upset with Julie Letterman's card. Uh, our good friend Michael Woods, Woodsy, wrote for NY Fights. He actually defended her scorecard, and in his argument, he said it was a hell of a lot better than Andre Ward's scorecard, which was a draw. Now, both of those cards actually are probably at the extreme, because if you look at this fight, it's like, what are we looking at? Well, we know Lopez won the early rounds. Ward gave Loma round two, but I still feel like Lopez won all the early rounds we know Lopez won round 12 if you look at the, the punch stats Lopez outlanded him by I think more oh, than yeah. double so you definitely give him 12 so now we're talking about that like 7 8 9 10 11 range mm -hmm. and so it is kind of up for debate we don't want it to be as wide as either one draw or just giving uh, Loma one round and to your point about solutions Maybe there's more judges. Maybe there's more. Um, the WBC tried something where they had the three judges there in person, and then they had three judges remotely. And now, so now you have six scorecards, and then you can kind of throw out those anomalies, right? Yeah. And that's what we want to do. And to your point about the media, yes, we need more transparency. This stuff is, it shouldn't be in the shadows, man. We need to see these people. They need to be held accountable because hopefully that will make for better scorecards. Well, listen, they don't get paid a lot. That's number one. It's a, not a high paying job. And if you take a look, it's always the same five or six judges in Las Vegas. It's been going on. It's just like a little club. They don't get paid a lot. They don't, they're never held accountable because the commission doesn't want to put their judges out there to have to explain their scorecards. So maybe if they 
they have to go in front of a camera and explain, or even if it's not on camera, just go on record and explain why you did that. Maybe they'll take it a little more seriously. If you take a look at what happened this past weekend in this Ritz and Vasquez fight, uh, you know, Judge Terry O'Connor, was he on his phone? Was he not? But other than that, gave a terrible scorecard. Guess what? He has to go face the board over in the UK and, and explain it, and then maybe he'll get suspended. They have a lot more accountability than we do here. That's something that we have to uh, improve because we can just talk about how bad the judges are, but there has to be solutions. Kerman Bhatti, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show and, and chopping it up with us. Uh, seismic change happened in the world of boxing, and let's hope for more of this. Uh, go back to work. Go uh, edit that <laughs> PBC countdown show and, and make us both look good. Seismic shift in boxing, like you said. And let me just add, they, they showed video of that judge who we thought was on the phone. He was actually looking at a piece of paper, possibly a scorecard no, for I'm only one second. That. Now, still not okay. You need to keep your eyes on the fight, but let's just get, let's get full transparency. Looked like it was a piece of paper. <laughs> All right, Kerman, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dan.